So I'd love to bring to the stage Brad Waldron. Brad is a property finance advisor working with clients to provide property finance advice when purchasing and investing in residential property. Brad started his journey with a Bachelor of Business in Tourism Marketing and was lucky enough to be recruited by Qantas Holidays in Los Angeles, straight out of university. It was there that while helping people plan their trips of a lifetime, that he first experienced the sheer joy that comes from helping people get the best out of life. Brad is a fully qualified mortgage and finance advisor with a certificate for and a diploma in mortgage and finance broking, along with being a full member of the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia. <clears throat> now, over the past eight years, Brad has helped hundreds, yes, hundreds of clients finance their properties, and he understands how property can help you build a secure life that yields long-term growth and family wealth. What Brad enjoys most is educating people on the home loan process and mortgage structures to generate more benefit out of your home loan. Sharing the excitement of getting people into their first home, second home, or investment properties is extremely rewarding and enjoyable. Born and bred in country Victoria, he spent 18 years in Melbourne and now lives in the Ballerine Peninsula with his wife and young family. He understands the peace of mind that comes with managing money wisely and home ownership. He loves finding solutions that help people live their best life. So whenever and wherever he can, I solve it. Let's give Brad a big hand and welcome him to the stage. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you, Anna. It's amazing how good you sound when you get introduced by the uh, professionals. So thank you for that. Thanks for your time. Um, yeah, obviously, as my um, speech mentioned, so it's tailored towards first home buyers. So understand that buying your first home can be a, um, I guess, maybe a confusing or stressful uh, stressful process. A lot of people don't really know where to turn, who to talk to, you know, what happens first, what happens second, how does it all work? So hopefully today we'll try and, um, yeah, try and dispel some of those myths or answer some of those questions for you. Um, I will just make a quick disclaimer that the information that I'm going to talk about is just general information. So there's quite a lot of moving parts to, to all this stuff. So it's hard to get um, too technical and you really need to get your own personal um, advice based on your situation. So we'll just talk in some general terms, um, but hopefully it's going to be yeah, valuable and informative for either you or someone that you might know. So we'll move through. So what I wanted to just start with is, um, I guess, a bit of engagement. So if you could just maybe pop into the chat box quickly. So there's a question there. Do you think buying your first home is harder today than it was 30-odd years ago? So if you just want to take a second to um, pop in your answer, just a yes or a no, it's not, yeah, there's no right or wrong, just maybe what you think um, the answer to that question is. Yep, so it seems to be the consensus is that it's probably harder today than it was 30 odd years ago, which is, yeah, look, there's no, there's, as I said, there's no right or wrong answer, but uh, there's an article there which is a little bit tricky to read, but I think it's from around sort of 1986. Uh, I believe it's a Sydney newspaper, which you can see the heading Home Buyers Hit for Six. Um, the very first um, sentence, I think it says, uh, Sydney's real estate market has priced first home buyers out of the out of the, the market. So I guess the moral of the story is it's, it's never been easy. Um, it maybe is harder today than it was back then, but it's certainly never been an easy, um, an easy process. So um, what we're going to cover in today's webinar, um, 
there's sort of five main topics that I wanted to talk through um, and we'll sort of move through them relatively quickly with the time that we have. So, so the minimum deposit that's required to purchase your first home, um, how your credit rating can impact your borrowing capacity. We'll touch on the difference between fixed and variable rate home loans. Um, leveraging guarantor loans and how you can actually buy your first home without having a deposit. And we'll touch on some of the current government grants that, um, that are available for first home buyers. All right, so minimum deposit required. So we often find this is the biggest, yeah, talking to first home buyers or potential first home buyers, we find this is often the biggest challenge is just trying to save that initial deposit that, that the banks require. Um, quite often your circumstances with regards to your work or your income, making the repayments or being able to service the loan is not, not really the, the main challenge. Often it's not that different to maybe the rent that you're paying, but just having that initial deposit um, can, be the, can be the hard part. If you're paying rent and cost of living and, and all those expenses that life uh, throws at us, it can be, it can be challenging. So in a, in a perfect world, a 20% deposit is, I guess, what I call the bank sweet spot. Um, so you'd have a 20% deposit and then the bank would lend you the other 80, 80%. So that's in a perfect world, but we all know that a perfect world we don't really live in and having a 20% deposit for, um, especially for first home buyers, is not, it's not realistic. So as just a bit of a guide or a rule of thumb, I often say that if you've got somewhere between maybe that seven to 8%, so that's seven to 8% of the property's value, um, then that's probably in a position where yeah, you might have some options to look at, um, yeah, to look at being able to do something. So certainly the more the better, but if you did have that, yeah, seven to 8%, um, that's certainly a, a great starting point. Uh, how your credit rating can impact your ability to buy your first home or obtain your first home loan. So if somebody's got multiple inquiries on your credit file, so you know you might have applied for a couple of credit cards, you've got a car loan, maybe you took out a personal loan to go on holidays once COVID allowed us to, to do that. Um, you know, the, the zip pay account, they're quite popular these days. So if you've got multiple inquiries on your credit file, it's certainly not the end of the world. It's not. You know, it's not a black mark by any stretch of the imagination, but it just opens up a few other questions with the banks. So um, it can sort of reflect how you manage your money, I guess. And um, yeah, so if you can avoid those, that can certainly help with your, yeah, with your ability to, to potentially get a, um, a home loan for your first home. Uh, so now I just did a quick scenario as well. So again, it's pretty sort of general terms, but I just did a, a scenario where if you had a, say a couple with uh, no children, so a young couple, uh, household income of 120,000, so sort of 60,000 each, depending on their living expenses, of course, they could potentially borrow up to maybe around 600,000 as a, as a home loan. And then I, comp so I compared that couple with, I guess the second couple, I didn't give them names, so couple number two, um, if they had a $10,000 credit card each and then they also had a $400 per month car loan each, their borrowing capacity drops down to somewhere around maybe the 400000 mark. So you can see it's quite a big, it's quite a big difference in, in how much you can potentially borrow um, if you've got some of those additional loans. Uh, having said that, I certainly understand not everyone can pay cash for a, a good safe car. So those, you know, a car loan and a credit card are convenient things to have. But just, yeah, just to see that the the impact that that can have on your on your potential borrowing capacity from a uh, from a home loan perspective. So fixed and variable rate home loans. So there's probably quite a lot I could talk about here. There's sort of lots of different loan products and bells and whistles that, that sort of come with home loans. But the two sort of main ones that I wanted to focus on and, and talk a little bit about is the fixed and variable rate loans. So as the name suggests, the, the variable rate 
home loan is a, a loan where the, the interest rate and therefore your repayments are variable. So they can go up, they can go down, depending on what happens with, um, with interest rates. So they are a bit more flexible. So they do allow you to make additional repayments onto the loans. So if you're someone that had a goal or a plan to pay over and above the minimum repayments, the variable rate loans allow you to do that. So you can put extra money on. And if for whatever reason you need to draw that money back off of your mortgage, um, the variable rates do allow you to do that. So they're a bit more, a bit more flexible but you are at the mercy of you know, changing interest rates and, and changing repayments as well. So on the flip side of that, there is the fixed rate loan. So you can normally nominate the period you want to fix it for. So anywhere between, say, sort of one to five years is the, the standard sort of time frame. Um, and again, as the name suggests, that means that your interest rate, your home loan repayments would be fixed in for that period of time. So say you pick a three-year fixed rate, um, for the next three years, your mortgage won't go up, won't go down. That's, that's the amount of your repayments and your interest rate. So they are a little bit less flexible than variable. So if often they'll have restrictions on the amount of extra payments you can put onto the mortgage. Um, so if you're someone that did want to put extra money on and have the ability to redraw it back off, uh, as a general rule, the fixed rates don't allow you to do that but they do give you that sort of certainty or peace of mind. So it really depends on your own preference or your own individual situation as to you know, what's, um, what's best for your circumstances. So I guess just to throw another little curveball in there, you can actually have the best of both worlds. So you can split your mortgage into two parts. So you can have part of it variable and then you can also have part of it fixed so that... Um, yeah, you effectively have sort of two loan parts and part of it's locked in and the other part is, is variable. So you can sort of structure it up that way as well. Okay, now, so how you can actually buy without the deposit. So this often sparks a bit of, uh, bit of interest. Um, so basically the way you can do it is to be nice to your parents. Uh, you should always be nice to your parents, of course, but effectively the way this works is that if you've got um, a parent, it's normally immediate family that say own, um, own a property, investment property or their own home. So they either own it outright or they may still have some mortgage on the home but have got a good amount of equity. They can effectively use their property as a guarantor for you to be able to buy your first home without actually having to have that, you know, that savings or cash deposit. So if you wanted to buy a, you know, a $500,000 property, the bank would allow you to borrow the, the whole amount. So you could take out a mortgage for $500,000 um, if you had someone to be your, your guarantor, as long as you're obviously comfortable with being able to make the repayments, of course. Um, so, yeah, if you're lucky enough that have someone or maybe a parent that yeah, operates similar to that particular picture that's quite um, generous, I guess, when it comes to kids, um, I sometimes find that's maybe a bit more grandparents than parents. But if you're lucky enough to have, um, yeah, someone that might be your guarantor. So there's obviously a few, you know, risks and, and obligations you need to understand with this type of arrangement. But uh, it's certainly a great way that you can either help your kids into the market or you know, get into the market, buy your first home without having a um, yeah having that sort of cash deposit or the challenge of trying to save that that deposit. Uh, so I'll just quickly touch on now some of the government grants that are available for first home buyers. So there's always yeah there's always something available for first home buyers. So there's probably the three main ones at the moment, which I'll go through. So uh, the top one there is that it's called a first home buyers guarantee scheme. So it's relatively new. Um, there was 30,000 of these released back on the 1st of July. Um, I know as of now, late November, there's definitely still some of those scheme places available. So what that allows you to do if you qualify for one of those places is instead of, I mentioned earlier, having to have that 7 or 8% deposit, um, you can have a, 
a flat 5% deposit. Um, and that can allow you to, yeah, I guess to, to buy your first home with a slightly less deposit than what you would under normal, under normal circumstances. So uh, I think I've had, yeah, six or eight clients um, been successful with those. Some have purchased properties already. Um, I think I've got two or three that are pre-approved and still house hunting. So it's a great, yeah, certainly a great scheme to help with the, the deposit challenges. Uh, stamp duty concessions. So stamp duty can be really expensive. If you're not a first home buyer, um, you're looking at you know maybe an extra four to five percent on top of the property price that you have to pay stamp duty um, when you're buying a a property. But as a as a first home buyer, um, generally properties up to six hundred thousand in value, um, you can actually be exempt from from paying any stamp duty. So it's a quite a quite a big savings. And then, yeah, the one that's been around for probably a long time in various forms is the first homeowner's grant. So as of today, that is a, a $10,000 grant. Um, and but that is for, for new properties only. So um, yeah, you'd need to be either building your first home new or buying a house and land package, a new apartments, something that's, that's new and never been, I guess, sold or lived in before. So it is just for new homes. And then, yeah, there is a couple of others depending on yeah, depending on your actual state. All right, so why bother even owning your own home? So it's probably sounds expensive. It sounds maybe a bit confusing. There's a lot of um, yeah, a lot of figures and a lot of terms I'm not that familiar with. But it's definitely got some longer term some longer term benefits, in my opinion. Uh, so I'm not sure if you've ever received a letter in the post from your, your landlord or your real estate agent saying that you do need to move out in 60 days time. So I know I definitely have. We received one, I think it was like a, the 20th of December, maybe one year. So that was um, a Merry Christmas from our landlord that we needed to start packing boxes as soon as we were back from our Christmas break. Um, it can give you that you know, long-term security for you and your family. Um, you've probably heard people say before that you know you'd, you'd be paying down your own mortgage and not someone else's, and it certainly builds equity and wealth over over time. So if you buy your first home and over time you're going to pay the loan down, um, hopefully the property is going to go up in in value, which creates the equity, and then that that just gives you choices. So you can then either sell that property and, and upgrade to something bigger or a more preferred suburb, or you can, you know, you can access the equity in that home to maybe buy an investment property. So it just gives you some choices to try and, um, I guess, you know, build your wealth and security over time if that's something that you would, um, I guess, be looking to do for, for you and your family. All right, so we're probably coming to the end a little bit now. So what, what's next and why I solve? So uh, I know there'll be the link in the chat box to connect, but I'll put a, um, a QR code there if, um, yeah, if anyone did want to scan that with your mobile phone. Um, you can just book in a, a chat with me. So a lot of what we've spoken about today is quite general. So we'd really need to have an individual discussion about your circumstances to, um, yeah, to assess your individual situation as to what what options you might have um, whether you're ready sort of in the near term or long term quite often with our first home buyers we do work with them over you know 6 12 or 18 months as long as it takes really to try and get you into that position to to be able to buy your um, your first home um, so we also have a I guess a, it's like a client for life philosophy so once once you come on board as a client with us we'll always be available to you know, to answer any questions you have um, around your, your home loan or your, your property plans. Um, as a general rule, we'll touch base with you at least once a year. So just to see, you know, how you're going, um, see if we can get you a, a slightly sharper interest rate with, with the current bank that you might be with. Um, so you'll just have someone to, to lean on with any of those questions. So I don't know of, and I'm not sure I will ever know of a bank that just rings you up out of the blue and says, um, Hi, Mr. Customer. I've got a lower interest rate for you, which I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna move you on to that that lower interest rate today. It's just not the way that the direct banks um, operate, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, so we'll have a, a long long term relationship. It's not just helping you once and then and then moving on.
Um, so I've probably gone a little bit under time, which is okay, but that's sort of the end of the presentation. What I have got just as a bit of a thank you, um, as part of our marketing, we run a like twice a year holiday, these holiday competitions. So I was hoping this latest one was going to be up and running. It's not actually open as yet. It opens on the 1st of December, but it's a competition where uh, you can enter to win a holiday to Greece for nine nights. So um, everyone that's on the, uh, I guess, the webinar, the, um, the summit today will have a, uh, an entry into that. There's no cost, no obligation at all. Um, there, if, um, sorry, if, if someone does book in to have a chat with me about their situation, then you do get some additional entries into that. And then also if we do end up working together at some stage, there's, yeah, there's sort of additional entries into, um, into that holiday competition as well. So um, yeah, you have to be in it to win it, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's probably the end of my presentation. I guess I might have a couple of moments if anyone did have a question or I'll, um, yeah, I guess I can hand it back over to, hand it back over to you, Anna.